Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to the Faith Book, a program that discusses contemporary and historical theological arguments from the book Haqq al Yaqeen. I'm your host, Mohsin Shah. And joining me is Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Assalamu alaikum, Sheikhna. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikhna, last time we were discussing, in the last episode, we discussed the different uh, terminologies and different meanings, the four meanings behind the word Tawheed from. Um, the hadith by Imam Ali alayhi salam. Inshallah, we'll, discuss, we'll continue this discussion. But first, I need to ask you, how was your Eid? Eid Mubarak to you, Shaykhna. Salaamu Eid Mubarak to yourself, to your family, the staff of Imam Hussein TV, and uh, to all the uh, lovers of uh, Ahlul Bayt. Uh, Eid in itself is a very special occasion as ordained by Islam. Uh, derivation from the word Eid being the word awda or awd returning back to allah azza wa jal however you find that every aid is covered with a certain type of grief there is an element of grief that overshadows every celebration of aid and in particular idul adha because you find that the days leading up to idul adha yani the day of arafah you have two major events you have, number one, the martyrdom of Imam Muslim bin Aqil, uh, the ambassador of Sayyid al-Shuhada, and the first shaheed from Bani Hashim, from the Shuhada of Karbala, who was martyred after being deserted in the city of Kufa. And you have also, as per the recording and as per the words of the Historians, in regards to Imam al Hussein, say the Shuhada alayhi salam, leaving Makkah on the day of Arafah, having abandoned the Hajj to leave towards Kufa. And this was as a result of Yazid al La'in having sent a number of assassins disguised as Hujjaj to come and spill the pure blood of Imam al Hussein in Makkah. Shaykh, this is something that's sometimes uh, not spoken about as much and, and, and needs thorough investigation that there were assassins sent to kill Imam Hussein Islam, in Makkah while he was doing this, before Karbala even happened. It was a plan from way, way before. Of course, and inshallah, perhaps in our uh, programs that we have for Shahrul Muharram, inshallah, exclusive. Uh, for Shahram Muharram and on Imam Hussein TV, we shall explore this in uh, further detail. But uh, to add on to what you said and to endorse what you just said, it was the plan of Bani Umayyah to spill the blood of Imam Al Hussein from day one from Medina, because Marwan ibn Hakam Al Lain is sent with a command from Yazid Al Lain in Muawiyah at that time from day one. Yani in the days of Rajab, 60 AH, that if Hussein ibn Ali does not give bay'ah to Yazid, then behead him from oh, Medina, no. which is why Imam al Hussein was forced to migrate from Medina towards Makkah. And when we say forced to migrate, not fleeing out of fear, but this was the first step of a very large revolution that Allah Azza wa Jal from the very top of the Arsh had planned out for Imam al Hussein. Sha'allahu ayyarani katila, Imam al Hussein says, in order for Islam to be saved and to be revived through the sacrifice of Karbala. And you find that spending the day of Eid in a state of grief and remembering the grief of Ali Muhammad is from the ways of commemorating Eid as per the Ahlul Bayt. Ahsan. We live at a time of great uh, fitna and fasad, and you have a lot of doubts that are planted within the minds of the people. And it was just a couple of days back where I came across a, uh, uh, a clip in where there was a question answer, and the person asks this so-called scholar from the host, and he says that people now start to grieve on the days of Eid. What is your opinion? And the guest comes forward who's supposed to be a scholar and he comes and he says that this is from the plot of the enemies of Islam. The enemies of Islam are the ones who propagate grief and azadari on the days of Eid. Subhanallah. And now we have hadith that has reached the level of tawatur 
and there are different levels of tawatur which we don't want to enter into. This is actually a talk on Eid. Our talk is on Ilmul Kalam and Aqa'id, but what greater Aqa'id than the Aqa'id taken from Ahlul Bayt Ahsan. and the words of Ahlul Bayt. For we have hadith, for example, in Iqbalul A'mal, Sayyid ibn Tawus, and similar hadith in Kitab Wasailu Shia and in Kitab Al Kafi, for example, where you have number of narrators. This one in Iqbalul A'mal, the narrator is Abdullah ibn Dinar, companion of Imam Al Baqir, Abu Ja'far, where he, Imam says to him on the day of Eid, Ya Abdullah, ma min Eid lil Muslimin adha wa la fitr illa wa huwa yatajaddad li al Muhammad fihi huzn. Ya Abdullah, there is not a single Eid for the Muslims. Be it Eid al Adha, no Eid al Fitr. Aliyam today is what? Eid al Adha. Yes. He says there's not a single Eid. Neither Adha, neither Eid al Fitr, okay. except that it renews the grief for Ali Muhammad. Yet Ajadad, this grief is re invoked again. Call, Yani Abdullah says, Kul to Lima. Why? Yabna Rasulullah. Day of Eid, day of yes. celebration, why grief? Qala alayhi salam. He said, the Imam, لِأَنَّهُمْ يَرَوْنَ حَقَّهُمْ فِي يَدِ غَيْرِهِمْ Because on this day of Eid, they see that their right is in the hands of other than them. Their right has been usurped till today. Mm -hmm. And from here, we have a deep understanding that the day of Eid is connected to the day of Wilaya. The day of Eid in, is, in its essence is cannot be separated from wilaya of Ahlul Bayt in all its perspective. For mm -hmm. we have hadith from Imam al-Baqir saying that the day of Eid is also a day of grief. We don't say don't celebrate. We don't say don't get together with your families for dinner and everything. But do not attack those people or condemn those people who also mourn and do azadari for Imam al Hussein on the day of Eid. Come up with rubbish, yani awam arguments that this is from the strategies of the of the enemies of Ahlul Bayt. When did the enemies ever want you to mourn for Imam al Hussein Aslan? But inshallah, kalamna at a different time. Inshallah, Shaykh Aslan. Before we go to our main discussion for this program, just a couple of lines on, on Muslim bin Aqil. I mean, um, you know, what was his relationship like with, the, with um, Imam Hussein? Also, he was the, the first cousin, as in his father was the brother of Imam Ali, if I'm not mistaken. His father, Akil alayhi salam, the elder brother of Amir al-Mu'mineen. And sufficient it is for the status of Muslim bin Akil, Sayyid Muslim bin Akil, or Imam Muslim bin Akil, Imam by the word Qaid, leader, from mm -hmm. its linguistic meaning. When Imam al Hussein sends him to Kufa as his ambassador, he sends him with a letter where he introduces Sayyid al-Shuhada introduces Imam Muslim bin Aqil by saying, Inni ba'ithun ilaykum akhi wa ibn ammi wa thiqati min ahli bayti. I send to you my brother. This is Sayyid Shabab Ahl al-Jannah ibn Fatimah al-Zahra alayhi salam He describes Muslim bin Aqil as saying, my brother. And then, the lineage, my cousin, as in in respect to the relationship of Akil with Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam, wa thiqati min ahli bayti, my most trustworthy, my most trusted individual from my ahlul bayt. And you know when Muslim bin Akil, Imam Muslim bin Akil came to Kufa, he was not only there to see how loyal the people were, he had a mission, and that mission was to in, induce a revolution before Imam al Hussein comes to Kufa. Ya Subhanallah. Imam Muslim bin Akil induced a revolution and planned a revolution, Habibi, before the coming of Imam al Hussein. This revolution was a prerequisite for Imam al Hussein to come back. Mm -hmm. Lawla the Khiyana had it not been for the Khiyana. And there is a lot of Dala'il and uh, Kara'in. Uh, tarikhiya, historical Qara'in that lead us towards this conclusion, apart from what the 
ulama and the muhakikin and the, the, the scholars of history have put forward to us. But you find that in part of this from the status of Muslim bin Akil. And sufficient this is for the status of Muslim bin Akil. That in order for the people of Kufa to pledge their allegiance and loyalty to Imam al Hussein, they had to give their bay'ah to Muslim bin Akil alayhi salam. Yani bay'ah to Imam Muslim bin Akil is equivalent to bay'ah to Sayyid al Shuhada. And this in itself, this in itself shows you the daraja of Muslim bin Akil alayhi salam. Ahsan Shaykh, thank Ahsan you very to. much. Let us continue from last week's episode and last week's uh, conversation in regards to the hadith by Amir al Mu'minin, the, the four meanings of the word Tawheed. Let's have a little recap, inshallah, and then we can continue with, with the lesson. Ahsan to him. So, last week and the week before, we were talking about the concept of the oneness of God. What does it mean when you say that Allah is one? What does the word Tawheed mean when I say La ilaha illallah? Or when I say as a Muslim or as a Shia, I profess the oneness of Allah. What does this term actually mean, oneness of Allah? Is it something that we just utter from the tongue? Do we even know what this word oneness actually means, Lola? So we had a look at the hadith from Kitab al-Tawheed, authored by Shaykh al-Saduq, rahmatullah alayhi. And uh, we analyzed the hadith of Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, where during the battle of Jamal, he was asked about Tawheed. And Amir al-Mu'mineen outlined four meanings of Tawheed, two of which are incorrect and two of which are correct. Yani, you could be a believer in Tawheed, but your understanding of Tawheed is incorrect. Okay. And we went through this over the last two weeks. Having said that, today, having understood what this term Tawheed means, the oneness of Allah Azza wa Jal, Today, our discussion revolves around establishing the necessity of a single creator. So you find that in the book Hakul Yakin by Alama Shabbar, Rahmatullah Alay, there is a chronology. And this chronology is followed by majority of the ulama from the mutakallimin, from the ulama of Ilmul Kalam. There is a logical chronology in that you prove the existence of a creator. Yani there is a creator, a superpower deity that exists that brought this entire realm of existence into existence. Once this is established, then we come and we establish the unity, the oneness of this superpower and this creator. Do you think that this is the same methodology that is used today? In the Hosa. And today when we have debates, theological debates with uh, people who don't believe in God or other schools of thought, do we still use this methodology that first we establish the existence of God, then we establish the unity uh, if, if he's like many or if he's one, the, 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 the monotheistic value of this God, and right. then we continue with that. Is this still implemented today? Or the mainstream, traditionally? No, the mainstream books of El Bul Kalam, as far as I know, mainstream books of Kalam have always followed this chronology. Because it is a logical chronology. One conclusion leads you to a second conclusion, to a third, fourth, and so on and so forth. In regards to debates, Yaret, we wish and we hope, and we have great hope in all our brothers and sisters who take upon this noble task of representing Ahlul Bayt within their universities and their workplace and in their schools that they follow within this manhaj. Because this is a manhaj that has been tried and tested, warranted and approved, and whose, statistically speaking, success rates are, they speak for themselves. For having understood Tawheed, today our aim is to establish the oneness of Allah. What is, having understood the definition of Tawheed, is it possible for there to be more than one God is it possible for there to be two gods or three gods or four gods, so on and so forth, multiple gods? Or like for example within a philosophy that emanates from the Far East and Greek philosophy to a certain extent where there were theories that you have a god of good and you have a god of evil. You have the god of light and you have the god of darkness. The power that resembles purity and the power that resembles evil. Can they be two creators or multiple creators that exist at the same time? 
Now, there are a number of ways in which we can tackle. What I want to do for today is that I want to refer back to the Quran. And you find over here that Allah Mashabbar Rahmatullah Alayh in the second chapter of Tawheed, yani the sub chapter, when he speaks about Tawheed with all the arguments to, uh, from the Quran and from the Ahlul Bayt, you find that one of the verses that he makes a reference to is Surah Al Anbiya, verse number 22, where he says, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا Had there been more than one God or had there been a God other than Allah, this would have resulted to fasad of this existence, realm of creation. Could you give us an example of what sort of fasad or what sort ha, of... Fasad, yani in the context of this verse and if we were to translate in English by meaning in order to get the meaning across corruption, okay. anarchy, lack of coordination, lack of perfection. Okay. Yani, if there were multiple creators, the perfection within the system of creation would cease to exist. This is from the Quran, Surah Al-Anbiya. Now, how do we prove this? Or what is the proof for this? That's going to be my next question. But yeah. Ahsantum. So what is the proof for this? You find over here that referring back to the tafsir of the Quran, you have explanations. And these explanations are made clear to us again from the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. So there is supporting hadith of Ahlul Bayt in regards to this tafsir. But I want to run through you today in regards to this verse of the Quran. See, the reason why we are paying importance on the verse of the Quran, as we said in the previous episodes and from the beginning, that the goal is to understand your Aqidah, understand your Usuluddin through the Quran and Ahlul Bayt, rather than going through means that are not pure and divine. A person might say, I want to use my Aqal. Which is fine, but we also say to them, Ya Akhi, the Quran talks to the intellect. The khitab of the Quran, the message of the Quran is directed towards the intellect. Definitely. It's supposed to prompt the intellect to think, the mind to think and to, and to deduce the right conclusions. Therefore, there is no contradiction between Quran and Aqal in that sense. In fact, the Quran strengthens the intellect and corrects the mind where it is prone to making mistakes. Tayyib. So, the tafsir that I want to go through with today in regards to this verse, such that we are able to establish the oneness of Allah and negate the multiplicity of creators. The tafsir that I want to refer to today is the tafsir known as Takrib al-Quran ila al-Adhan. This is a tafsir of the Quran that was authored by the late Marhum Ayatullah al udbah Sayyid Muhammad Husseini al-Shirazi, Rahmatullah alayhi. Ayatullah al-Shirazi, the uh, deceased elder brother of uh, a current Marja Taklid, well-known, well-respected Ayatullah al udbah Sayyid Sadiq al-Shirazi. May Allah grant him and the rest of uh, our virtuous mujtahideen and maraja a long and healthy life. For you find that from one of the 1400 writings Mashallah. of Ayatollah. 1400 writings? Uh, 1400 writings Mashallah. of uh, Ayatollah Sayyid Muhammad al Shirazi. In fact, uh, from what I uh, understand uh, from the family members of, uh, of the Marja, is that um, even the publishers and the people who had taken it upon their tasks to collate the writings of the late Marja and to send them to the publishers, they could not keep up with the number of writings. Wow, mashallah. Uh, I think I may have oh, mentioned yeah. this for uh, Minhal a couple of weeks back. Maybe I mentioned it or not. But even you see that during the end of his life, Ayatollah uh, Sayyid Muhammad al-Shirazi, uh, when he would write, you would see the manner in which he holds his pen. You would see that some of the pictures that are there and some of the witnesses who actually saw this, they would see him holding the pen in a very strange way, something like this. Hmm. Because the muscles and the tendons Ouch. within the finger wow, wow. 
always being in a state of writing, he had somehow damaged those tendons or their muscles such that he was not even able to straight to bend his finger anymore. They were straightened like this. And from these, I say for us, are lessons from our ulama and our fuqaha who sacrificed everything they have in order to serve Ahlul Bayt and in order to ensure that you and I are able to seek guidance from the material and the literature and the legacy left behind for us by Ahlul Bayt. And uh, it is important for us to acknowledge these efforts and to acknowledge this jihad aslan of the ulama before us. Do we have enough time for the break or before the break or should we dive in? Inshallah, uh, Shaykhna, with your uh, permission, we will continue with the tafsir Ahsan after the break. Inshallah, brothers and sisters and dearest viewers, join us after the break where the Shaykhna will continue the lesson if we can the tafsir by his, the late Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi, inshallah. Until then, Salaamu Alaikum wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. See you after the break. Welcome back to the faith book where we'll be discussing theological uh, arguments from the book Haqqal Yaqeen with myself, Muslim Shah, and Sheikh Muhammad Abbas Panju. Sheikh Nah, Salaam Alaikum. Alaikum Salaam Alaikum. Sheikh Nah, you were going to discuss the tafsir of uh, by Sayyid Muhammad Shirazi in regarding to an ayah. Would you please <coughs> continue? Of course. Fa, the verse of the Quran that we are referring to, Surah Al Anbiya, verse number 22. And the verse reads, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهِ لَفَسَدَتَا فَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَرْشِ عَمَّا يَصِفُونَ For the translation of the first part of the verse, had there been for this creation, for this realm of existence, a Lord other than Allah, then it would have led to, it would have led to Corruption. Corruption meaning that had there been a God in addition to Allah, there would have been chaos, anarchy, lack of coordination, and lack of perfection within the realm of this existence. Tayyip, prove to me how. Exactly. Yeah. How does this happen? This is an idda. This is a claim that is made within the Quran. So we need to tahlil, we need to analyze this very carefully to understand the accuracy of this claim within the Quran. Just a quick reminder to our viewers that this is a live show and you can call in if you have a question in regards to today's lesson. You call us on 0203 515 or alternatively you can WhatsApp us, the number should be at the bottom there. Sheikhna, please continue. Tayyib, so how do we begin this analysis? Sayyidah Shirazi alayhi, in the commentary of this verse comes forward and says that in regards to this style of uh, making the claim or this style of advocating a reality, the style is known as al istidlal, yani istidlal min al ma'lul ila al illah, the, the reasoning. The, the procedure or the logical approach is, what is this logical approach? The logical approach is establishing the validity of a cause by looking at the effects. Okay. okay? Sometimes you are able to recognize the cause by looking at the cause. Sometimes you are able to recognize the reality of the cause by looking at the effect. Okay. So we have a rule, everybody knows in physics and in life, the law of cause and effect. Yes. Fire causes smoke. Yes. 
yes. for example, cause and effect. So, over here, the logical approach used by the Quran is that we are able to establish the reality of the cause by looking at the effect. Okay. So, applying this to the verse, the, we are able to establish the cause which is the reality of the cause which is the oneness of Allah how by looking at the ma'lul which is the creation, creation yani ahsantum the corruption of the creation or anarchy within the creation creation being the effect of a creator yes the anarchy within the creation which is the effect establishes for us the reality of the cause okay. which is the oneness of the creator okay now this is the logical approach used by the quran again how yes. because it's almost like we're talking in code language so because I'm, I'm getting a confused there. let me get this right uh the, you could say the, the the limitations or the effects or, or the, the the what you call it like the limitation of the of the effect the human being and and the anarchy and chaos that human beings cause shows that the, the original cause, the original creator, is one. No. What we are saying is, had there been more than two gods, okay. there would have been anarchy in the system of creation. Oh, we've got some now. <laughs> ah, <sir. laughs> Within the system of creation. So we said in the previous series that in order to establish the existence of Allah, or one of the ways through which we establish the existence of Allah, is perfection within the creation. Okay. Yani, you okay. see how there is a proper chronology and a system of interdependency between the level of oxygen in the air okay. and the necessity of oxygen yes. for man to yes. live and the interdependence yes. between the animal kingdom and plant kingdom and then the water cycle and the water and, uh, cycle where the sun rises and, yeah, and the weather and the culture. Yes, yes, and so, this okay. perfection Indicates. Would have been disrupted okay. had there been more than one creation. Okay, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, okay. Asantum. So, anarchy in that creation, right, would or perfection of that creation leads us back to the existence of one God. Okay. Had there been multiple gods, there would have been anarchy within the perfection of that creation. Okay. So, lack of anarchy within the system of creation or lack of anarchy or no anarchy within the system of perfection leads us to the conclusion of the oneness of God. So would it be So you're looking at the end to get to the beginning point. So would it be fair to say that if there were more than one God, then there will be two or three suns. Each God would have its own sun, its own moon its own weather patterns and they would clash and they would clash ah, ah, okay. so now this is what we are getting towards look at what the Sayyid comes and says so he says how can we again how can we prove that had there been theoretically speaking had there been two gods it would have resulted in anarchy within the system of creation okay maybe one would have wanted oxygen to be 50 percent of air Mm -hmm. And the other God says, no, 20%. For example, yes. how can we prove that there would have been anarchy? The Sayyid comes forward and says, in that multiplicity of gods, yani, multiplicity, the occurrence, hypothetically speaking, the multiplicity of God can necessitate or can happen from one of two perspectives. Number one, min nahiyati that and number two, min nahiyati lawazim. From the essential dimension, number one. And number two, from the circumstantial dimension. Okay. What is the essential and what is the circumstantial? The essential dimension. Min nahiyati that. Ya'ni, he says, if there were going to be two gods, on the assumption that there were two gods, all right? These two gods must have certain characteristics, right, that are shared between them, okay. that allows them or that qualifies them to be God to begin with. 
They okay. must have certain characteristics within them, like all powerful yes. and Hakim and Ghani and all this. Yes. Correct? Correct. One. Number two, they must also have characteristics that distinguish them from each other. Okay. Because we have two gods. Yani each god has a separate identity. Yes. Correct? In order to have a separate identity, meaning what? You have a characteristic that separates you from mm. me. Yes. And this is how the mind will then be able to understand that we have two gods and distinguish one god from, from the, the other. other. Okay. Correct? Yes, correct? Look at the log logical sequence yes, of this. Yes. So we have for each god, god A and god B, characteristics that are similar to both of them, all-powerful, all all-encompassing, and uh, everything of that sort. But they also have features that distinguish them. Features or characteristics that distinguish God A from God B. Mm -hmm. Yani characteristics that distinguish the sovereignty of God A from the sovereignty of God B. Correct? Correct. Otherwise, had it not been for this distinguish, distinguishable, if that's a word, if had it not been for this distinguishable characteristic, we would not be able to distinguish or separate between these two gods. Correct? Correct. Tayyib. Look at the istidlal of the Sayyid over here. Latif Jiddan. Say the Shirazi says, if this is the logical assumption, that each god, A and B, has characters that are similar, but at the same time have characters that distinguish one from the other, mm. then that means that each god is dependent on that character that distinguishes him from the other god. And the moment you have a god that is dependent on a character that distinguishes him that God is no more all-powerful because he is Muhtaj. So, if the God is Muhtaj, this cancels out the theory that there exists two gods because our claim is that this God has to be all-powerful mm. and is not dependent on anything. This is number one. Number two, if the God is made up of characteristics that distinguish him from other gods, then this means that this God is made up of characteristics and his existence is dependent on those characteristics. These characteristics that distinguish him and characteristics that are also similar, both these characteristics make up that God. That means what we have done is we have divided God into parts. Yes. The essence of this God is comprised of characteristics that are shared yes. and characteristics that are exclusive. Yes. Each one depends on the other and needs the other in order to come up with the whole. The parts make up the sum. So that means that God is again made up of multiple parts and each multiple part needs another part which means your God is a God that is dependent okay. rather than a God that is independent. independent. That's right. That's right. Logically, yes. what you have done is you have demolished the theory that or the uh, hypothesis that there can exist more than one God. This is one form of istidlal. Any question or comments? Sheikh sure, can we say that the, the way you explained it, that in different parts, can we look at it as like a, like a pie chart where certain pieces are, or parts of the pie chart represent what makes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala God God and then other small bits or whatever that make him um, used to differentiate him from, uh, to separate him from other types of gods. So you have different pieces to the right. puzzle. Is, is, this the, is this the right 
abstract uh, idea that we're trying to This is to one way in which a person could think about it. But the fact that, our main point here is that, the fact that you have a God that needs a character that distinguishes him from another God, this need, this being needy cancels out his qualification or nullifies okay. his qualification in order to be that ultimate superpower. Okay, I see where you're coming from. I see, I stand. So basically, this is to do, this is to show that if there were two or three gods, the the differences between them show that there's one superior over the other. Now, if there's a god that is inferior, that that can't be god. You can't classify Ahsan. that person now, as a, now that this comes, deity as a god. Ahsan. Now this comes. What you have said comes under the second type of proof. Okay. which is the circumstantial perspective. Oh, okay. From the essential perspective, what we are saying is the fact that this God has a character that he depends upon, that he is dependent upon okay. in order to distinguish him from any other God, yes. that characteristic and his dependency on that characteristic nullifies right. his qualification to be the ultimate God and superpower over everything within creation. Ahsan. Because if you were to remove that sifat that distinguishes him from any other God, then there is no way to differentiate between the two. Yes. Sahih. So in order to recognize that there are two gods or three gods, they have to have that sifat in between them. And this is what we are disproving. Tayyip. The second way of understanding this verse of the Quran, look at the ma'arif, look at the depth that comes out from the words spoken by Allah Azza wa Jal. Yani people who understand philosophy and people who have studied logic, these are arguments, yani sarahatan, they hit the intellect to its very core. Yes. لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةً آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهُ لَفَسَدَتَا The second way of analyzing this is by looking at the circumstantial perspective. Circumstantial perspective, yani, the Sayyid goes to say over here that there are, under circumstantial perspective, there are two possibilities. From the two possibilities, the first possibility has three possible cases. Inshallah, maybe next time we can have a whiteboard and we can draw a chart, inshallah, 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 inshallah to make sure that definitely, the definitely, mutabi'in definitely. are not confused. Shaykhna, yeah, we've got a call on the line, I believe. Inshallah, we'll be able to get through to them. Assalamu alaikum, your name and where you're calling from? Assalamu alaikum, my name is Hussein Jawad, I'm calling from Hull. Hussein Jawad from Hull, Assalamu wa rahmatullah. Your question, please, for the Shaykh. My question is How can we establish the oneness of Allah to the atheists or anyone from a different religion? Hassan, thank you very much. Thank you. Shaykhna, how do we establish the oneness of God to an atheist or uh, someone from a different religion? Inshallah, this is what we are trying to do right now, inshallah. <laughs> uh, if the viewer uh, was able to look into this verse of the Quran, and this way we are able to prove the oneness of God. This Which is for people was? who believe. Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 22. 22, Surah Anbiya, inshallah. This is in regards to proving the oneness of God. For a person who may believe in the existence of multiple gods, the god of rain and the god of sun and the god of night and the god of wind and so on and so forth. For the brother's question from Hal, proving the existence of God to an atheist is a different ball game. In that, over here you are speaking with people who already believe in the existence of a superpower. The difference is they believe in a number of superpowers and now we believe yes. in one superpower. So the idea is to move them from multiplicity to unity, from shirk towards tawheed. However, with the atheist, we are steps back. It's a different ballgame altogether. The atheist doesn't believe in a creator to begin with, which is why we would say to the brother, inshallah, if you were to look at the previous series for the shows, one of the best ways, and this is the rule of thumb, to debate with the atheist is this. And this is something that we have repeated many times. Perfection, contemplation over the perfection within the system of creation is the greatest proof to the existence of a God. 
Because if somebody was to tell you it is, it happened by chance, the Big Bang Theory, by chance, mathematically speaking, mathematically speaking, perfection on multiple fronts cannot happen by chance. Uh -huh. Mathematically speaking, it's an impossibility. The probability of everything within creation coming into existence by chance, mathematically is impossible. This is number one. Number two, a person might come and tell you, yes, it's Mother Nature that came and created everything. Tayyip, describe for me, who is Mother Nature? What is Mother Nature? Does it have irada? Is it kawi? Is it ghani? Is it qadir ala kulli shay? What exactly is this Mother Nature? Where did it come from? Many times, many times, if, and this is something that we have seen and things that we, things we have seen, things that we have heard through credible people, those who actually believed in Mother Nature or who claim that Mother Nature is what brings everything into existence, Mother Nature is another word they subconsciously don't realize. But they are using the word Mother Nature, but in essence, referring to Allah Azza wa Jal. There just needs to be a little bit more ma'rifah, a little bit more conviction, a little bit more encouragement to push the argument two or three steps further, and they reach towards Tawheed. In any case, because what is Mother Nature? You see, many of the sifat that they give to Mother Nature, they are actually sifat of Allah Azza wa Jal. What stops them? This is a different discussion altogether. But this mm. is what I would say to my brother in short. Contemplating over the perfection within the system of creation necessitates in the conclusion of the existence of a creator. Inshallah. Coming back to the verse of the Quran, لَوْ كَانَ فِيهِمَا آلِهَةٌ إِلَّا اللَّهَ لَفَسَدَتَا The second proof for the impossibility of the multiplicity of creators circumstantial perspective the Sayyid goes on to say if on the supposition on the hypothesis that there existed more than one God say there were two gods is it possible logically speaking in the world of hypothesis is it possible to claim is it possible to make the supposition that these two gods would have differences of opinion? Yes or no? They probably would, yes. They would. Is it a logical probability? In the world of logic, in the world of our mind, is it a possibility that we can perceive in our mind that if there were two gods that they would differ from each other in opinion? Most, most likely. It is possible. So, within the world of, within the realm of intellectualism, when you have two gods, there are one of two possibilities. Either, either there is a probability that they can differ with each other in opinion, or there is a probability that they don't differ with each other. Is there any third probability that can come out from this? No. Within the world of logic, there is no third probability. If there is a probability, we ask from the mushahideen, please call us and uh, educate us please, and enlighten please. us within the world of intellectualism <laughs> and within the world of logic. Can there be a third possibility out no. of this? No. So, let us work on the assumption that you have two gods and it is intellectually possible for us to suppose that these two gods could have a difference of opinion. If they have a difference of opinion, is it possible for two gods to have a difference of opinion? If Definitely. we say yes. Yes then one of three things can happen. Okay. So let us take an example over here. God A, in regards to giving life and death, Fulan Miskin, Amir Riza. Okay. You have one believer in God by the name Amir Riza. God A says, I want to take his life. Okay. God B says, I want to extend his life. Hmm. Tayyib, what can happen from here? One of three things can happen. Either the will of God A happens and the will of God B happens simultaneously. <laughs> if this happens simultaneously, logically it's an impossibility. Why? Because God A wants to give Amir is a life. 
God B wants to take life away from Amir Riza. You cannot have Amir Riza dead and know. at the same time be alive. You can neither have him neither dead nor alive at the same time. Sahih Lola. Sahih. So this cannot happen. So the only other option that is remaining is what? That. One overpowers the other. Ah, santo. <laughs> one God overpowers the other one. If we say it is possible for one God to overpower another God, that means the less stronger God doesn't deserve to be God. That's because right. one of the sifat of God is that he is all powerful and does what he wants, when he wants, however he wants. We have the verse of the Quran just after this. Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 20, 24. This God, Allah Azza wa Jal, the creator of the universe, is not asked, cannot be interrogated or be taken into any form of accountability, does not have to compromise or anything doing. So you see that, again, this verse of the Quran, if we were to contemplate upon it, the way the Mufassir of this verse of the Quran, Ayatollah Shirazi, makes clear for us, you find that there is a very strategic, logical approach into understanding this verse of the Quran. And you look at the depth that is extracted or that can be found from within this verse of the Quran. This was one case. Let us say, again, within the realm of logic is it possible that these two gods do not conflict with each other very possible so we took into consideration the situation where these two gods conflict with each other yes we said that if they had a, you know they could have a difference of opinion they can have a difference one of opinion. would overpower you ah, santo. and we said if they were to have a difference of opinion only one of three possible things can happen within the field of logic sahih yes. person comes and says yeah but actually not necessary that two gods conflict. It could be that both of the gods do not conflict with each other. If we were on the supposition that there exists two gods and they do not conflict with each other, then we ask ourselves, why do they not conflict? Is it because they don't have the ability to conflict with each other? Or is it because they have the ability to conflict with each other, but decided to cooperate? If we say that they do not have the ability to conflict with each other, a God who does not have an ability is a God that is nakis, yes. is has a shortcoming, is yes. incomplete, yes. and is not all-powerful. If the God is not all-powerful, he doesn't deserve to be a God. Definitely. So that thing is out. This option is out. So we come to the second option. That no, they have the power to conflict, but, don't. but decide not to. When we say, but decide not to, what does it mean? That means that each god may have a difference of opinion, but each god decides to compromise and to restrain the power to exercise or restrain the ability to exercise his power to establish his rule. The minute the God compromises, meaning that he is limited in the execution of his power as a creator, we say that he doesn't qualify to be a creator. I'm sorry, because you can't really put... Uh, God and compromise in the same sentence. It, yeah, doesn't really make sense. it doesn't make sense at all. Yeah, which is why you find that this verse of the Quran is extremely important in understanding the unity and the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with this, we are able to nullify all the arguments that are brought forward into the multiplicity of a creator. And through this as well, 
if we were to drag this argument again a notch or two in the other direction, we are able to nullify the theory which is propagated within the Shia circles of the multi unity of God through multiplicity of God. You know, we don't want to enter into that debate. Inshallah, we will have a particular uh, series towards sure. this and how Ahlul Bayt actually nullified those theories mm -hmm. that are taught within uh, the schools of Muslim philosophy at the moment, for example, yeah. actually exported or imported from Greek atheistic yeah. philosophy. But in any case, you find that this verse is important in proving the existence of one God. And we come back again to, to end our series over here or the kalam for today. The importance of using the Quran to understand the Tawheed. And mm -hmm. the importance of using the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt in order to understand the Tawheed. Our Madaris, the Madrasas that we have around the world, the books that we have for Aqa'id, the books that we have of Usuluddin, rather than depending on the mind which is fallible and using arguments deduced by the mind which could be prone to mistakes. Is there anybody who can tell us that the mind is not prone to mistakes? Of course, yes. Nobody can claim that the mind is exempt from mistakes. Mm -hmm. Not everything that you deduce academically is correct just because you deduced it academically. The mind has the capacity to understand Allah Azza wa Jal without doubt. But the mind also has the capacity through its nature to make mistakes in understanding Allah. Definitely. And this is something that we understood Definitely. and we took home from the hadith of Amirul Mu'mineen alayhi salam last week. That it is not necessary that just because you believe in Tawheed that you are on the right path and going to Jannah. La, your understanding of Tawheed could be wrong. Hence the manhaj of the Quran and the manhaj of Ahlul Bayt is so important. Understand the fundamental tenets of our deen using the Quran and using the hadith of Ahlul Bayt. Today within the madrasa, if I am teaching Usulul Deen, I as a teacher, I need to prepare the curriculum and the syllabus of Usulul Deen, particularly in the issue of Tawheed, using the Quran, verses of the Quran. And you can look at the depth of this one verse of the Quran which we have taken from one Mufassir. Allah Shahid has taken almost half an hour and this is a very condensed understanding of what could be extrapolated from this verse in the Quran. It's important that within the, our curriculums within the Madrasa that we use the Quran and we use the Hadith of Ahlul Bayt to teach our children to educate ourselves on what the true Islam is. And the reason that we emphasize on this, Habibi Sayyid Mohsin, and you, you probably agree with me on this or you have a different opinion, but you find that many times even in the madrasas that we are affiliated or associated with or we hear about, you find that there is this surge at the moment of refining and reinventing madrasa curriculums in the manner in which we will teach Usuluddin to our children. A manner which is compatible with the 21st century. And there is nothing wrong with that. But the problem is that when we use this as an excuse to use non-infallible text yes. or fallible texts or arguments from fallible individuals and abandon them. I think there was a time back in one of the centers that I was affiliated with. They said, yeah, we don't really discuss and debate uh, Islam with the atheists uh, by using the Quran. We come up with other arguments and we look at <laughs> other people's arguments. I said, why the Quran is not, uh, the Quran is not uh, suitable for this? They said, yeah, but they are not Muslims. As soon as we tell them we believe in the Quran, <laughs> they say we're not Muslims. Yeah, Akhi, the Quran is talking towards the intellect, is addressing the intellect agree. regardless yeah. of what you believe in or who you believe in. Rasulullah was debating with the mushrikeen using the Quran. Yes. Ya akhi. Yes, definitely. <laughs> I mean, the Quran itself, there's many cases where it actually, um, you know, tests the human and asks of the human, you know, is, is it like this or is it like that? Or it questions the human being. 
countless times we can think about it. Especially when it came to, you know, people were, were thinking that this Quran isn't real, or this Quran was man-made, then it was saying, sure. you know, on the lines of, it tested the human, said, so, okay, if it isn't, then, you know, write a book like this, or, or write of a chapter course. like this, or reverse like this, if this is not from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And you look at it, even within the philosophers, within who, who concentrate on these issues of ma'arif, in understanding the existence of the Creator, come with arguments as solid as these from within the Quran. You will find that it's perhaps not possible. But to ending statement, our message for ourselves and for our beloved viewers, lovers of Ahlul Bayt, it is extremely important that we incorporate the Quran. We understand Allah and Tawheed from the Quran and from the Ahlul Bayt. Asan, Asan, Shaykh. I can't thank you enough for today's lesson and, and inshallah the Sheikh will be back next week inshallah with the new lesson in terms of theology from the book Haqq al Yaqeen. Until next time, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.